Welcome back! Excuse me. Excuse me, sir. This is not your toy. This is my sleeping toy. We do not play with the teddy we bear. We do not. We are back here with a new book. Yeah. A book that is a current obsession for both of us. Yes. Uh, and it is Red, White, and Royal Blue. What's up? What's up? <laughs> it is written by Casey McQuinston. Mm -hmm. Hope I said that right. Sure. I've had this book in for my for for like a year. It yeah. was uh, suggested to me by our mutual friend Miguel. Yeah. Shout out What's to up, my baby? book pal. Yeah. Um, and it was actually I think we even did a, a trade. I I got oh. this and she got Jellico Road, which oh my god, you still have not read. And I'm full disclosure not done with this, but I'm close to done. You with not? It. I'm not done with it. I know, I know. I've read it twice. Listen to it. I've listened to it twice. Yeah. I Like, in a week. It's good. I listened to it in a day. Yeah. That was crazy. The whole thing started with... It was a with, lot. <laughs> the whole thing started with Ollie uh, writing me, going, yeah. the, the main character of this book is basically Duke. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I was like, hmm, maybe I should maybe read it I now. Maybe I should read it. And I was sick, so I was like, well, why not? So yeah. I started, and, and we sort of had this, like, you were listening to it. You were like, you need to catch up. And I was like, I'm just, I'm trying to, wait, I'm just gonna, it's hard, because you were listening to it. I was like, it. three <laughs> chapters, and yes. then I was like, please yeah. read faster. Yeah. And it was hard, because, like, you were listening to it, so you could do other stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, like, every time you texted me, I had to pause reading and be like, I'm trying to catch up, wait. And then my like trying to speed read it but th that it wasn't hard to speed read it no no, no it's no. it's it's so fun it's so good yeah and um Great. it is a lgbtq based love story yeah ish young adult YA. romantic love story yeah. um between uh the first son uh uh of america and the the Prince of Wales, uh, the Prince of England, um, yeah. And I, I don't know how much more we should say. Nothing. That's it. Nothing. Um, we're just gonna read a few chapters. I'm already sweating, so this is gonna be great. We're not gonna read the spice. Uh, this one. We're not gonna read the spice. <laughs> we're not gonna do smut. We're not gonna do smut on this. This is this is the reading nook. This is supposed to be like chill and cozy and nice, and we're not gonna. Bring the pulse up to that level in the reading nook. That will be another corner of the internet. <laughs> we'll find some other corner we'll for that. We'll find some other corner of the internet for Hashtag the smut. Hashtag let's yeah. make an OnlyFans. Or just a Patreon where we can read smut for you guys if you want that. <sighs> we should do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just read all the uh, smut. Shout it into the void if you would like us to have to a read Patreon smut? where we just, just read smut. smut. <laughs> no, where Eli reads smut and I look at them. The front says, true love isn't always diplomatic. And um, for the record, I am going to uh, attempt to go back and forth between a British and an American accent in so this one. Excited. And I uh, I got up at five this morning. So this yeah. will be fun. <laughs> this is a going theme. Mm -hmm. like, that I have not having... slept. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the, I also love this. The, the like... Inscription. Not inscription, but it's like credit credited to, I guess. The dedication. For the weirdos and the dreamers. And I love that. <laughs> All right. One. <clears throat> On the White House roof, tucked into a corner of the promenade, there's a bit of loose paneling right on the edge of the solarium. If you tap it just right, you can peel back enough to find a message etched, 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 etched. Edged. It's with a T. Et, etched. Etched. <laughs> We're going on strong. Do you want to start now? Um, if you tap it just right, you can peel it back enough to find a message etched underneath. 
with the tip of a key or maybe a stolen West Wing letter opener. In the secret history of first families, families an insular gossip mill sworn to absolute discretion about most things on pain of death. There's no definite answer to who wrote it. The one thing people seem certain of is that only a presidential son or daughter would have been daring enough to deface the White House. Some swear it was Jack Ford with his Hendrix records and split-level room attached to the roof for late-night smoke breaks. Others says it was young Lucy Johnson, thick ribbon in her hair. But it doesn't matter. The writing stays, a private mantra for those resourceful enough to find it. Alex discovered it within his first week of living there. He never told anyone. He's never told anyone how. It says, rule number one. Don't get caught. The east and west bedrooms on the second floor are generally reserved for the first family. They were first designated as one giant state bedroom for visits from the Marquis de Lafayette in the Monroe administration. But eventually they were split. Alex has the east across from the treaty room and June uses the west next to the elevator. Growing up in Texas, their rooms were arranged in the same configuration on either side of the hallway. Back then, you could tell June's ambitions on the month by what covered the walls. At 12, it was watercolor paintings. At 15, lunar calendars and shards of crystals. At 16, clippings from The Atlantic, a UT Austin pennant, Gloria Steinem, Sora Neil Hurston, and excerpts from the papers of Dolores Hercha? Hercha. Hercha. I don't know either. His own room was forever the same, just steadily more stuffed with lacrosse trophies and piles of AP coursework. It's all gathering dust in the house they still keep back home. On a chain around his neck, always hidden from you, view, he's worn the key to that house since the day he left for DC. Now, straight across the hall, June's room is all bright white and soft pink and minty green, photographed by Vogue and famously inspired by old 60s interior design periodicals. <laughs> she found in one of the White House interiors. <laughs> that was such a long sentence. And I was like, where is the, where is the right space to breathe here? I was like, next, next word, next word, next word. You, next need, word. To, you need to breathe. You need to, okay, let's think. It was such a second. long sentence. <sighs> Let's try it again. Now, mm -hmm. straight across the hall, June's room in all bright white and soft pink and minty green, photographed by Vogue and famously inspired by old 60s interior design peri periodicals she found in one of the house, White House sitting rooms. His own room was once Carolyn Kennedy's nursery, and later, warranting some sage burning from June, Nacy Reagan's office. He's left up the nature field illustrations in a neat symmetrical grid above the sofa, but painted over Sasha's, Sasha Obama's pink walls with a deep blue. Typically, the children of the president, at least for the past few decades, haven't lived in the residence beyond 18, but Alex started at Georgetown the January his mom, mom was sworn in, and logistically, it made sense not to split their century or cost to whatever one-bedroom apartment he'd be living in. June came that fall, fresh out of UT. She never said it, but Alex knows she moved in to keep an eye on him. She knows better than anyone else how much he gets off on being this close to the action, and she's bodily yanked him out of the West Wing on more than one occasion. Behind his bedroom door, he can sit and put Hall and Oates on the record player in the corner, and nobody hears him humming along like his dad to Rich Girl. He can wear the reading glasses he always insists he doesn't need. He can make uh, as many meticulous study guides with color-coded sticky notes as he wants. He's not going to be the youngest elected congress congressman in modern history without earning it, but nobody needs to know how hard he's kicking underwater. His sex symbol stock would plummet. Hey, says a voice at the door, and he looks up from his laptop to see June edging into his room, two iPhones and a stack of magazines tucked in under one arm, and a plate in her hand. She closes the door behind her with her foot. What'd you steal today? 
Alex asks, pushing the pile of papers on his bed out of her way. Assorted donuts, June says as she climbs up. She's wearing a pencil skirt with pointy pink flats, and he can already see next week's fashion column. A picture of her outfit today, a lead-in for some spawn con about flats for the professional gal on the go. He wonders what she's been up to all day. She mentioned a column for WAPO, or was it a photo shoot for her blog, or both? He can never keep up. She stumped her stack of magazines out on the bedspread and is already busying herself with them. Doing, I don't know who says this, he is, <laughs> doing your part to keep the great American gossip industry alive. That's what my journalism, journalism degree is for, June says. Anything good this week? Alex asks, re reaching for a donut. Let's see, June says. In touch says I'm dating a French model. Are you? I wish. She flips a few pages. Oh, and they're saying you got your asshole bleached. That one is true, Alex says, through a mouthful of chocolate with sprinkles. Thought so, Jim says without looking up. After riffling through most of the magazines, she, she sub shuffles it to the bottom of the stack and moves on to people. She flips through absently. People only ever writes what their publicist tells it to write. Boring. Not much on us this week. Oh, I'm a crossword puzzle clue! Following their tabloid coverage is something of an idle hobby of hers, one that in turn amuses and annoys their mother. And Alex is narcissistic enough to let June read him the highlights. They're usually either complete fabrications or lines fed from their press team, but sometimes it's just funny. It's just funny. <laughs> I thought the sentence continued, but it's just funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's just funny. <laughs> Given the choice, he'd rather read one of the hundreds of glowing pieces of fan fiction about him on the internet. The up to 11 version of himself with devastating charm and unbelievable physical stamina. But June flat out refuses to read those aloud to him, no matter how much he tries to bribe her. Do us weekly, Alex says. Hmm. June digs it out from the stack. Oh, look, we made the cover this week. She flashes the glossy cover to him, which has a photo of the two of them inlaid in one corner, June's hair pinned on the top of her head, and Alex looking slightly overserved but still handsome, all jawline and dark curls. Below it, in bold yellow letters, a headline reads, First Siblings Wild NYC Night. Oh yeah, that was a wild night, Alex says, reclining back against the tall leather headboard and pushing his glasses up his nose. Two whole keynote speakers, nothing sexier than shrimp cocktails and an hour and a half of speeches on carbon emissions. It says here you had some kind of tryst with a mystery brunette, June reads. Though the first daughter was whisked off by limousine to a star-studded party shortly after the gala, 21-year-old heartthrob Alex was snapped sneaking into the W Hotel to meet a mystery brunette in the presidential suite and leaving around 4 a.m. Sources inside the hotel reported hearing ominous noises from the room all night, and rumors are swirling the brunette was none other than Nova Holleran, the 22-year-old granddaughter of White Vice President Mike Holleran and third member of the White House trio. Could it be the two are rekindling their romance? Yes, Alex grows, and June groans. That's less than a month. You owe me $50, baby. Hold on, was it Nora? Alex thinks back to the week before, showing up at Nora's room with a bottle of champagne. The thing on the campaign trail a million years ago was brief, mostly to get the inevitable over with. They were 17 and 18 and doomed from the start, both convinced they were the smartest people in any room. Alex has since conceded Duke. Nora. Van. <laughs> Dora. It's crazy how much do you get? It's literally the same person. Yes. It's uh, so funny. It's so crazy. <laughs> I swear to God, I had not read this when I wrote Dude. No, no. Oh my God. It's crazy. It's so funny. <laughs> it's insane. Alex has since conceded Nora is 100% smarter than him and definitely too smart to have ever dated him. It's not his fault the press won't let it go, though that they love the idea of hearing, hearing them together as if they're a modern day... 
Let's try this sentence again. Yeah. It's not his fault the press won't let it go, though. It's not his fault the press won't we'll let, let it go, go though. though. Uh, that they love the idea of them together as if they're the modern day Kennedys. So if he and Nora occasionally get drunk in hotel rooms together watching the West Wing and making loud moaning noses at the wall for the benefit of nosy tabloids, he can't be blamed, really. <laughs> They're simply turning an undesirable situation into their own personal entertainment. Scamming his sister is also a perk. Maybe, he says, dragging out the vowels. June swats him with a magazine like he's an especially obnoxious cockroach. That's cheating, you dick. Bet's a bet, Alex tells her. We said if there was a new rumor in a month, you'd owe me 50 bucks. I take Venmo. I'm not paying, June huffs. I'm gonna kill her when we see her tomorrow. What are you wearing, by the way? For what? The wedding? Whose wedding? Uh, the royal wedding, June says, of England. It's literally on every cover I just showed you. She holds us weakly up again, and this time Alex notices the main story in giant letters. Prince Philip says I do, along with a photograph and an, of an extreme screws. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> what was that? What happened? <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so concerned. It was just the word extremely and something happened with my brain. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Replay the tapes. <laughs> An extremely screws. What? Along with a photograph of an extremely nondescript British heir and his equally nondescript blonde fiance, smiling blandly. He drops his donut in a show of devastation. That's this weekend? Alex, we're leaving in the morning. June tells him. We've got two appearances before we even go to the ceremony. I can't believe Sara hasn't climbed up your ass about this already. Shit, he groans. I know I had it written down. I got sidetracked. What, by conspiring with my best friend against me and the tabloids for $50? No, with my research paper, smartass, Alex says, gesturing dramatically at his pile of notes. I've been working on it for, for Roman political thought all week. That's a class. And I thought we agreed Nora's our best friend. Roman political thought. That's a class. How much Fine. time? Roman political yeah, yeah, thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm messing with you. Oh. <laughs> you were dying. <laughs> I thought we agreed Nora's our best friend. I'm not. I'm doing good. I'm having fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> oh, look, it continues. <laughs> that can't possibly... No, but listen to this. The continuation is, that can't possibly be a real class you're taking. I agree, June, mm -hmm. June says. Uh, is it possible you willfully forgot about the biggest international event of the year because you don't want to see your arch nemesis? June, I'm the son of the President of the United States. Prince Henry is a figurehead of the British Empire. You can't just call him my arch nemesis, Alex says. He returns to his donut, chewing thoughtfully, and adds, Arch nemesis implies he's actually a rival to me on any level and not, you know, a stuck-up product of inbreeding who probably jerks off to photos of himself. Woof. I'm just saying. Well, you don't have to like him. You just have to put on a happy face and not cause an international incident at his brother's wedding. Bug, when do I ever not put on a happy face? Alex says. He pulls a painfully fake grin and Jules, Jules, June looks satisfyingly repulsed. Ugh, anyway, you know what you're wearing, right? Yeah, I picked it out and had Sarah approve it last month. I'm not an animal. I'm still not sure about my dress, June says. She leans over and steals his laptop away from him, ignoring his nose of protest. Do you think the maroon or the one with the lace? Lace, obviously. It's England. Why are you trying to make me fail my class, he says, reaching for his laptop only to have his hand swatted away. Go curate your Instagram or something. You're the worst. Shut up. I'm trying to pick something to watch. Ew, you have Garden State on your watch list? Wow, how's film school in 2005 going? 
I hate you. Mm, I know. Outside his window, the wind stirs up over the lawn, rustling the linden trees down the garden. The record on the turntable in the corner has spun into a fizzy silence. He rolls off the bed and flips it, resetting the needle, and the second side picks up on London luck and love. If he's honest, private aviation doesn't really get old, not even three years into his mother's term. He doesn't get to travel this way a lot, but when he does, it's hard not to let it go to his head. He was born in the hill country of Texas to the, to the daughter of a single mother and the son of a Mexican immigrant. All of them dirt poor. Luxury travel is still a luxury. Fifteen years ago, when his mother first ran for the house, the Aussie newspaper gave her a nickname, the Lometa Longshot. She'd escaped her tiny hometown in the shadow of Fort Hood, pulled night shifts at diner to put herself through law school, and was arguing discrimination cases before the Supreme Court by 30. She was the last thing anybody expected to rise up out of Texas in the midst of the Iraq War, a strawberry blonde, whip-smart Democrat with high heels and unapologetic drawl, and a little biracial family. So it's still surreal that Alex is cruising somewhere over the Atlantic, snacking on pistachios in a high-becked leather chair with his feet up. Nora is bent over the New York Times crossword up opposite him, brown curls falling from her for across her forehead. Beside her, the hulking Secret Service uh, agent Cassius, Cash for short, holds his own copy in one giant hand, racing to finish it first. The cursor on Alex's Roman, Roman political thought paper blinks expectantly at him from his laptop. But something in him can't quite focus on school while they're flying transatlantic. Amy, his mother's favorite Secret Service agent, a former Navy SEAL who is rumored around DC to have killed several men, sits across the aisle. She's got a bulletproof titanium case of crafting supplies open on the couch next to her and is serenely embroidering flowers onto a napkin. Alex has seen her stab someone in the kneecap with a very similar embroidery needle. That was a hard word, embroidery. Which leaves June next to him, leaning on one elbow with her nose buried in the issue of people she's inexpl inexplicably brought with them. She always chooses the most bizarre reading material for flights. Last time, it was a battered old Cantonese phrase book. Before that, <clears throat> Death comes for the Archbishop. What are you reading in there now? Alex asks her. She flips the magazine around so he can see the double page spread title. Royal Wedding Madness. Alex groans. This is definitely worse than Willa Cather. What? She says. I want to be prepared for my first ever royal wedding. You went to prom, didn't you? Alex says. Just picture that only in hell and you have to be really nice about it. Can you believe they spent $75, no, $75,000. <laughs> $75 would be reasonable. That would be that's reasonable. That's still a fucking expensive <laughs> cake. Yeah. Can you believe they spent $75,000 just on the cake? That's depressing. And apparently Prince Henry is going sans date to the wedding and everyone is freaking out about it. It says he was, she affects a comical English accent. Oh no, she does, doesn't she? She sure does. <laughs> she, sure. she sure does. <clears throat> okay, a comical, wait, what's the word? A, a, a comical English accent. Okay. Rumored to be dating. That would be up to me. Accent. This is how an American person would read an English accent. This is how a Swedish person would read an American <laughs> reading a silly British accent. Yes. Rumored to be dating a Belgian heiress last month, but now followers of the prince's dating life aren't sure what to think. Alex, so Smith. sorry to all countries. <laughs> I'm just following the instructions. Yeah, 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 yeah. Alex snorts. It's insane to him that three 
there, uh, no, it's insane to him that there are legions of people who follow the intensely dull dating lives of the royal siblings. He understands why people care where he puts his own tongue, but at least he had personality. Uh, maybe the female population of Europe finally realized he has a comp he, a he's as compelling as a wet ball of yarn, Alex suggests. Nora puts down the crossword puzzle, having finished it first. Cassius glances over and swears. Uh, you gonna ask him to dance then? Alex rolls his eyes, suddenly imagining twirling around a ballroom while Henry drones sweet nothings about croquet and fox hunting in his ears. <laughs> the thought makes him want to gag in his dreams. Aw, Nora says, you're blushing. Listen, Alex tells her, royal weddings are trash. The princes who have royal weddings are trash. The imperialism that allows princes to exist at all is trash. It's trash turtles all the way down. Is this your TED talk? June asks. You do realize America is a genocidal empire too, right? Yes, June, but at least we have the decency not to keep a monarchy around, Alex says, throwing a pistachio at her. There are a few things about Alex that June and June that new White House hires are briefed on before they start. June's peanut allergy. Alex's frequent middle of the night request for coffee. June's college boyfriend who broke up with her when he moved to California, but is still the only person whose letters come to her directly. Alex's long-standing grudge against the youngest prince. It's not a grudge, really. It's not even a rivalry. It's a prickling, unsettling annoyance. It makes his palms sweat. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> the tabloids, the world, decided to cast Alex as the American equivalent of Prince Harry from day one, since the White House trio is the closest thing America has to royalty. It has never seemed fair. Alex's image is all charisma and genius and smarking wit. <laughs> Duke, 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 Duke all the way down. Mm, 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 Duke turtles mm, mm, all the way down. Um, I think this book has just like percolated on your bookshelf for so long that like the idea it's of been like spewing out to me. Just yeah, like, I think so. Probably. <laughs> it's been like, hey, different. do you wanna like do you wanna do you wanna play an asshole? <laughs> Do you want to play the most assholey, the most boy narcissistic, the smartest, but also the dumbest, dumbest and also like so annoying. the gayest, the gayest, but also fucks though. Yes, but also gay. Yeah, uh, the biggest bisexual. Alex's image. It's all charisma and genius and smirking wit, thoughtful interviews, and the cover of Q GQ at eighteen. Okay. Henry's is placid smiles and gentle chivalry, chivalry and generic charity appearances, a perfect blank Prince Charming canvas. Henry's role, as uh, Alex thinks, is much easier to play. Maybe it's technically a rivalry. Whatever. <laughs> All right, MIT, he says. What are the numbers on this one? Nora grins. Hmm. She pretends to think hard about it. Risk assessment, F-S-O-T-U-S, which is, I think, first son of the United States. Yeah. But it's such a weird, yeah. But F-S-O-T-U-S, -S falling to check himself before he wrecks himself will result in a greater than 500 civilian casualties. 98% probability of Han a Prince Henry looking like a total dreamboat. 78% probability of Alex getting himself banned from the United Kingdom forever. Those are better odds than I expected, June observes. Alex laughs, and the plane soars on. London is an absolute spectacle. Crowds cramming the streets outside Buckingham Palace, and all through the city, draped in Union Jacks and waving tiny flags over their heads. There are commemorative royal wedding souvenirs everywhere. Prince Philip and his bride's face plastered on everything from chocolate bars to underwear. Alex almost can't believe this many people care so passionately about something so comprehensively dull. He's true there won't be this kind of turnout in front of the White House when he or June get married one day, nor would he even want it. The ceremony itself seems to last forever, 
but it's at least sort of nice in a way. It's not that Alex isn't into love or can't appreciate marriage. It's just that Martha is a perfectly respectable daughter of nobility, and Philip is a prince. It's as sexy as a business transaction. There's no passion, no drama. Alex kind of love, Alex's kind of love story is much more Shakespearean. It feels like years before he's settled at a table between June and Nora inside Buckingham Palace ballroom for the reception banquet, and he's irritated enough to be a little reckless. Nora passes him a flute of champagne, and he takes it gladly. Do either of you, uh, do, do either of y'all know what a vice count is? June is saying halfway through a cucumber sandwich. I've met like five of them, and I keep smiling politely as if I know what it means when they say it. Alex, you took comparative international governmental relation things, whatever. What, what are they? I think it's that thing when a vampire creates an army of crazed <laughs> sex waves and starts his own ruling body, he mm. says. That sounds right, Nora says. She's folding her napkin into a complicated shape on the table, her shiny black manicure glitting in the chandelier light. I wish I were a vice count, June says. I would have my sex waves deal with my emails. Or is it waif? I'm just pretending. Uh, I don't know what the word is. Uh, this, I think it, I have no idea what this means, what waif means. I'm just, or if it's wife, I don't, it should be waif. I guess it's waif. Are sex waves good with professional correspondence? Alex asks. Nora's napkin has begun to resemble a bird. I think it could be an interesting approach. Their emails would be all tragic and wanton. She tries on a breathless, husky voice. Oh, please, I beg you, take me, take me to lunch to discuss fabric samples, you beast. Could be weirdly effective, Alex notes. Something is wrong with both of you, June says gently. <laughs> Alex is opening his mouth to retort when a royal attendant materializes at their table like a dense and dour looking ghost in a bad hairpiece. Miss Clamontius, says the man, who looks like his name is probably Reginald or Bartholomew or something. <laughs> he bows, and miraculously, his hairpiece doesn't fall off into June's plate. Alex shares an incredulous glance with her behind his back. His Royal Highness Prince Henry wonders if you would do, if you would do him the honor of accompanying him for a dance. June's mouth freezes halfway open caught on a soft vowel sound, and Nora breaks out into a shit-eating grin. <clears throat> oh, she'd love to, Nora <laughs> volunteers. She's been hoping he'd ask all evening. I, June starts and stops, her mouth smiling even as her eyes slice at Nora. Of course, that would be lovely. Excellent, Reginald Bartholomew says, and he turns and gestures over his shoulder. And there Henry is, in the flash. In the flash, in the flesh. And he flashes. And he flashes, in the flesh, as classically handsome as ever in his tailored three-piece suit, all tussled sandy hair and high cheekbones and soft, friendly mouth. He holds himself with a... So just to make it clear, <laughs> he hates this guy. That's yeah. why he describes him that way. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I describe all my enemies. <laughs> Arch nemesis. Yes. He holds himself with an innately impeccable posture, and as he em as, as if he emerged fully formed and upright out of some beautiful Buckingham Palace posy garden one day. His eyes lock on Alex's, and something like annoyance or adrenaline spikes in Alex's chest. He hasn't had a conversation with Henry in probably a year. His face is still infuriate, infuriatingly symmetrical. <laughs> because that's a thing. Yeah. Annoyingly symmetrical. Ugh. I hate when my enemies. <laughs> I hate when my enemies' faces are like so annoyingly like symmetrical. Because it makes me like hate them more. Yeah. And like that adrenaline thing that I feel <laughs> in my body when they like stand over there. Like, what is that even? <laughs> like, I get all, like, sweaty from the adrenaline, I guess. And, like, tingly. Yeah, and just, like, tingly, like, in my belly. <laughs> and, yeah. Oh, my god. So weird. <laughs> so good. Henry decides to give him a perfunctory nod. Sure. Perfunctory.
punch him. Absolutely. As if he's any other random guest, not the person he beat to evoke editorial debut in their teens. Alex blinks, seats, and watches Henry angle his stupid chiseled jaw to <laughs> Stupid. He was such a stupid chiseled jaw. Oh my god. Like, the jaw is so stupidly chiseled. I cannot. <laughs> He's so stupidly handsome. He's so stupid and I has, hate like, him. perfect bone structure. <laughs> His body is just, like, ugh, so So gross. grossly attractive. Oh god. <laughs> Either way, he, Henry, Henry angles his stupid, stupidly chiseled jaw at June. Oh my god, now I need to do Henry. Okay, I need to get into a British accent somehow. Do it. We've been doing that, but now it's just hard to do get it. into the... Just do it. Okay, gosh. This is so chill. <laughs> this is no problem. <sighs> no pressure. Hello, June. Let's start with that, Henry says. <laughs> he extends a gentlemanly hand to June, who is now blushing. Nora pretends to swoon. Do you know how to waltz? I'm sure I could pick it up, she says. And she takes his hand cautiously, like she thinks he might be pranking her. Which Alex thinks is way too generous to Henry's <laughs> sense of humor. Henry leads her off to the crowd of twirling nobles. So is that happening now? Alex says, glaring down at Nora's napkin bird. Has he decided to finally, finally shut me up by wooing my sister? Oh, little buddy, Nora says. She reaches over and pats his hand. It's cute how you think everything's about you. It should be, honestly. That's the spirit. He glances up into the crowd where June is being rotated around the floor by Henry. She's got a neutral, polite smile on her face, and he keeps looking over. He keeps look, looking over her shoulder, which is even more annoying, annoying. June is amazing. The least Henry could do is pay her attention to her. Do you think he actually likes her, though? Nora shrugs. Who knows? Royalty are weird. Might be a courtesy, or oh, there it is. A royal photographer has swooped in and is snapping a shot of them dancing. One Alex knows will be. Could you go away, little <laughs> fly? Murder happens. <laughs> murder. A royal murder. A royal murder. Um, a royal photographer has swooped in and is snapping a shot of them dancing. One Alex knows will be leaked to Hello next week. So that's it then. Using the first daughter to start some idiotic dating rumor for attention. God forbid Philip gets to dominate the new cycle for a week. He's kind of good at this, Nora remarks. Alex flags down a waiter and decides to spend the rest of the reception getting systematically drunk. Alex has never told, will never tell, anyone, but he saw Henry for the first time when he was 12 years old. He only ever reflects upon it when he's drunk. How he's, convenient. <laughs> he's sure he saw his face in the news before then, but that was the first time he really saw him. June had just turned 15. And I'm, sorry, I'm, just, I'm just trying to keep a straight face because I know what happens, but I can't. June had just turned 15 and used part of her birthday money to buy an issue of a blindingly colorful teen magazine. Her love of trashy tabloids started early. In the center of the magazine were miniature posters you could rip out and stick up on your locker. If you were careful and pried up the staples with your fingernails, you could get them out without tearing them. One of them, right in the middle, was a picture of a boy. He had thick, thorny hair and big blue eyes, a warm smile, and a cricket bat over one shoulder. It must have been a, a candid because there was a happy, sunbright confidence to him that couldn't be posed. On the bottom corner of the page, in pink and blue letters, Prince Henry. Alex still doesn't really know what kept drawing him back, only that he would sneak into June's room and find the page and touch his fingertips to the boy's hair as if he could somehow feel <laughs> as if he could somehow feel its texture if he imagined it hard enough. The more his parents climbed the political ran ranks, 
the more he started to reckon with the fact that soon the world would know who he was. Then, sometimes, he'd think of the picture and try to harness Prince Harry's easy confidence. He also thought about prying up the staples with his fingers and taking the picture out and keeping it, keeping it in his room, but he never did. His fingernails were too stubby. They weren't made for it like June's, like a girl's. But then came the first time he met Henry, the first cool, detached words Henry said to him. And Alex guessed he had it all wrong, that the pretty, flung-open boy from the picture wasn't real. The real Henry is beautiful, distant, boring, and closed. This person the tabloids keep comparing him to, whom he compares himself to, thinks he's better than Alex and everyone like him. Alex can't believe he ever wanted to be anything like that. Alex keeps drinking, keeps alternating between thinking about it and forcing himself not to think about it, disappears into the crowd and dances with a pretty European heiresses about it. He's pirouetting away from one when he catches sight of a lone figure hovering near the cake and the champagne fountain. It's Prince Henry yet again, glass in hand, watching Prince Philip and his bride spinning on the ballroom floor. He looks politely half-interested in that obnoxious way of his, like he has somewhere else to be, and Alex can't resist the urge to call his bluff. He picks his way through the crowd, grabbing a glass of wine off a passing tray and downing half of it. When you have one of these, Alex says, sliding up to him, you should do two champagne fountains instead of one. Really embarrassing to be at a wedding with only one champagne fountain. Alex, Harry Henry says in that meddlingly posh accent. Oh my fucking god. Up close, the waistcoat under his suit jacket is a lush gold and has about a million buttons on it. It's horrible. I wondered if I'd have the pleasure. Looks like it's your lucky day, Alex says, smiling. Truly a momentous occasion, Henry agrees. His own smile is bright white and immaculate, made to be printed on money. The most annoying thing of all is Alex knows Henry hates him too. He must. There are naturally mutual antagonists, but he refuses to outright act like it. Alex is intimidately, intimid, intim, intimidly, Im, intimately, intimately, intimately aware politics involves a lot of making nice with people you loathe, but he wishes that once, just once, Henry would act like he act like an actual human and not some polished little wind-up toy sold in a palace gift shop. He's too perfect. Alex wants to poke it. Mm -hmm. Quite literally. Quite literally. <laughs> Do you ever get tired, Alex says, of pretending you're above all this? Henry turns and stares at him. I'm sure I don't know what you mean. I mean, you're out here getting the photographers to chase you, swanning around like you hate the attention, which you clearly don't since you're dancing with my sister, of all people, Alex says. You act like you're too important to be anywhere, ever. Doesn't that get exhausting? I'm a bit more complicated than that, Henry attempts. Ha! Oh, Henry says, narrowing his eyes. You're drunk. I'm just saying. Alex says, resting an overly friendly elbow on Henry's shoulder, which isn't as easy as he'd liked it to be since Henry has about four infuriating inches of length on him. You could try to act like you're having fun occasionally. Henry laughs ruefully. I believe perhaps you should consider switching to water, Alex. Should I? Alex says. <laughs> He pushes aside the thought that maybe the wine is what gave him the nerve to stomp over to Henry in the first place and makes his eyes as coy and angelic as he knows how. Am I offending you? Sorry, I'm not obsessed with you like everyone else. I know that must be confusing for you. Do you know what? Henry says. I think you are. Alex's mouth drops open while the corner of Henry's turns smug and almost a little mean. Only a thought. Henry says, tone polite. 
Have you ever noticed I have never approached you and have been exhaustively civil every time we've spoken, yet here you are seeking me out again? He takes a sip of his champagne. Simply an observation. What? I'm, I'm not Alex, Alex Stammers. You're the... How a lovely evening, Alex. Henry says tersely, tersely, and turns to walk off. It drives Alex nuts that Henry thinks he gets to have the last word. And without thinking, he reaches out and pulls Henry's shoulder back. And then Henry turns suddenly and almost does, and almost does push Alex off him this time. And for a brief spark of moment, Alex is impressed at the glint in his eyes, the abrupt burst of an actual personality. The next thing he knows, he is tripping over his own foot and stumbling backwards into the, to the table nearest him. He notices too late that the table is, to his horror, the one bearing the massive eight-tire wedding cake, and he grabs for Henry's arm to catch himself, but all it does is throw both of them off balance and send them crashing together into the cake stand. He watches as if in slow motion, as the cake leans, teeters, shudders, and finally tips. There's absolutely nothing he can do about it. It comes crashing down into the floor in an avalanche of white buttercream, some kind of sugary $75,000 nightmare. The room goes heart-stoppingly silent as momentum carries him and Henry through the fall and down, down onto the wreckage of the cake on the ornate carpet, Henry's sleeve still clutched in Alex's fist. Henry's glass of champagne has spilled all over both of them and shattered, and out of the corner of his eye, Alex can see a cut across the top of Henry's cheekbone beginning to bleed. For a second, all he can think as he stares up at the ceiling while covered in frosting and champagne is that at least Henry's dance with June won't be the biggest story to come out of the royal wedding. His next thought is that his mother is going to murder him in cold blood. Beside him, he hears Henry mutter slowly, Oh my fucking Christ. He registers dimly that it's the first time he's ever heard the prince swear before a flash from Summer's camera goes off. <laughs> I love this book so much. This is a lot. This is a lot. Chapter two. With a resounding <laughs> smack, Sarah. <laughs> just a just a short little moment to, to let the gay just <laughs> just gotta settle the gay, all the gay. It's a, it's a gay fairy tale for sure. Fairy tale, fairy tale, fairy tale. Fairy tale. I know. Thank God. Because it's, it's another. Because it's another. Oh. Okay. So there's. Okay. There's like. I didn't get the joke that I made. No. <laughs> That's why. Oh, it'd be good. <laughs> That's gay. I've been like flirting with the camera every time you like said something. I've been like. <laughs> <laughs> I looked up a few times as well. Been like. With a resounding smack, Sarah slaps a stack of magazines down on the West Wing briefing room table. This is just what I saw on the way here this morning, she says. I don't think I need to remind you, I live two blocks away. Alex stares down at the headlines in front of him. The $75,000 stumble, Battle Royale, Prince Henry and F.S. Is there a short sodas? I don't know. Comes, <laughs> is there a short? Just say the F -S -O -T -U -S. word. F-S-O-T-U-S. No, but like say the first one. Sodas. No, first, first son of the of, United States. Just say that. Okay, that's easier. Come to blows at royal wedding. At cake eight, Alex Claremont Diaz sparks second English-American war. 
each one is accompanied by a photo of himself and Henry flat on their backs in a pile of cake. Henry's ridiculous suit, all askew and covered in smashed buttercream flowers, his wrist pinned in Alex's hand, a thin slice of red across Henry's cheek. Are you sure we shouldn't be in the situation room for this meeting? Alex attempts. Neither Sarah nor his mother sitting across the table seems to find it funny. The president gives him a withering look over the top of her reading glasses and he clams his mouth shut. It's not exactly that he's afraid of Sarah, his mom's deputy chief of, chief of staff and right hand chief of staff. Uh, Sarah, his mom's deputy chief of staff and right-hand woman. She has a spiky exterior, but Alex swears there's something soft in there somewhere. He's more afraid of what his mother might do. They grew up made to talk about their feelings a lot. And then his mother became president and life became less about feelings and more about international relations. He's not sure which opinion spells a worse, worse fate. Sources inside the royal reception report the two were seen arguing minutes before the cake catastrophe. Ellen reads out loud with utter, utter disdain from her own copy of The Sun. Alex doesn't even try to guess how she got her hands on a daily edition of a British tabloid. President Mom works in mysterious ways. But royal family insiders claim the first son's feud with Henry has raged for years. A source tells the son that Henry and the first son have been at odds ever since their first meeting at the Rio Olympics, and the animosity has only grown. These days, they can't even be in the same room with each other. It seems it was only a matter of time before Alex took the American approach, a violent altercation. We really don't think you can call tripping over a cake a violent Alexander, Ellen says, her tone eerily calm. Shut up, he does. One can't help but wonder, Ellen reads on, if the bitterness between the two powerful sons has contributed to what many have called an icy and distant relationship between President Ellen, Claremont, Ellen Claremont's administration and the monarchy in the recent years. She tosses the magazine aside, folding her arms on the table. Please tell me another joke, Ellen says. I want so badly for you to explain me to me how this is funny. Al Alex opens his mouth and closes it a couple of times. He started it, he says finally. I barely touched him. He's the one who pushed me and I only grabbed him to try and catch my balance and... Sugar, I cannot express to you how much the press does not give a fuck about who started what. Ellen says. As your mother, I can appreciate that maybe this isn't your fault, but as the president, all I want is to have the CIA fake your death and ride the dead kid's sympathy into the second term. Alex clenches his jaw. He's used to doing things that piss his mother's staff off. In his teens, he had a penchant for confronting his mother's colleagues with their voting discrepancies at friendly DC fundraisers. And he's been in the tabloids for things more embarrassing than this, but never in quite such a cataclysmically, internationally terrible way. I don't think, I don't have the time to deal with this right now, so here's what we're gonna do, Ellen says, pulling a folder out of her portfolio. It's filled with some official looking documents punctuated with different colors of sticky tabs, and the first one says, Agreement of Terms. Uh, Alex says, You? she says, are going to make nice with Henry. You're leaving Saturday and spending Sunday in England. Alex blinks. Is it too late to take the faking my death, death option? Sarah can brief you on the rest, Ellen goes on, ignoring him. I have about 500 meetings right now. She gets up and heads for the door, stopping to kiss her hand and presses it to the top of his head. You're a dumbass, I love you. And then she's gone heels clicking behind her down the hallway, and Sarah settles into her vacated chair with a look on her face like she'd prefer arranging his death for real. She's not technically the most powerful or important player in his mother's White House, but she's been working by Ellen's side since Alex was five, and Sarah was fresh out of Harvard. 
She's the only one trusted to wrangle the fam first family. All right, here's the deal, she says. I was up all night conferencing with a bunch of uptight royal handlers and PR pricks, and the prince is fucking... Equally? Maybe? Uh, to make this happen. So you're going to follow this plan to the letter and not fuck it up, got it? Alex still privately thinks this whole thing is completely ridiculous, but he nods. Sarah looks deeply unconvinced, by, but presses on. First, the White House and the monarchy are going to release a joint statement saying what happened at the royal wedding was a complete accident and a misunderstanding, which it was. And that, despite rarely having time to see each other, you and Prince Henry have been close personal friends for the past several years. We're what? Look, Sarah says, taking a drag from her massive steel... Stainless, st stainless steel thermos of coffee. Both sides need to come out of this looking good. And the only way to do that is to make it look like your little slap fight at the wedding was some sort of homoerotic frat bow mishap, okay? So you can hate the heir to the throne all you want, write mean poems about him in your diary, but the minute you see a camera, you act like the sun shines out of his dick and you make it convincing. <laughs> Have you uh, met Henry? Alex says. How am I supposed to do that? He has the personality of cabbage. <laughs> Are you really not understanding how much I do not care at all about how you feel about this? Sarah says. This is what's happening. So your stupid ass doesn't distract the entire country from your mother's re-election campaign. Do you want her to have to get up on the debate stage next year and explain to the world why her son is trying to destabilize, destabilize American-European relationships? Well, no, he doesn't. And he knows in the back of his mind that he's a better strategist than he's been about this. And that without his stupid grudge, he probably could have come up with this plan on his own. So Henry is your new best friend, Sarah continues. You will smile and nod and not piss off anyone when you, while you and Henry spend the weekend doing charity appearances and talking to the press about how much you love each other's company. If someone asks about him, I want to hear you gush like he's your fucking prom date. She slides him a page of bullet, uh, a page of bulleted lists and tab tables of data so elaborately organized he could have made it himself. It's labeled HRH Prince Henry fact sheet. You're going to memorize this, so if anybody tries to catch you in a lie, you know what to say, she says. Under hobbies, it lists polo and competitive yachting. Yacht, yacht, yachting. 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 Alex is going to set himself on fire. Does he get one of these for me? Alex asks helplessly. Yep. And for the record, making it was one of the most depressing moments of my career. <laughs> she slides another page over to him, this one detailing requirements for the weekend. Minimum of two social media posts per day highlighting England slash visit thereof. One on-air interview with ITV mo this morning, lasting five minutes in accordance with determined narrative. Two joint appearances with photographer photographers present. One private meeting, one public charity appearance. Why do I have to go over there? He's the one who pushed me into the stupid cake. Shouldn't he have to come here and go on SNL with me or something? Because it was the royal wedding you ruined. And they're the ones out 75 grand, Sarah says. Besides, we're arranging his appearance at a state dinner in a few months. He's not any more excited about this than you are. Alex pinches the bridge of his nose where a stress headache is already percolating. I have class. You'll be back by Sunday night, DC time, Sarah tells him. You won't miss anything. So there's really no way I'm getting out of this. Nope. Alex presses his, his lips together. He needs a list. When he was a kid, he used to hide pages and pages of loose leaf paper covered in messy, loopy handwriting under the worn denim cushions of the window seat in the house in Austin. Rambling treatises on the role of government in America 
uh, with all the G's written backwards, paragraphs translated from English to Spanish, tables of his elementary school classmates' strengths and weaknesses, and lists, lots and lots of lists. The lists help. That's a rough word. Lists. 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 So, reason this is a good idea. One, his mother needs a good press. Two, having a shitty record or on foreign relationship. <laughs> having a shitty record on foreign relations definitely won't help his career. Three, free trip to Europe. Okay, he says, taking the file. I'll do it, but I won't have any fun. Good, I hope not. The White House Trio is, officially, the nickname for Alex, June, and Nora, coined by People shortly after the inauguration. In actuality, it was carefully tested with focus groups by the White House press team and fed directly to People. Politics. Calculating, even in hashtags. Before the Claremont, the Kennedys and Clintons shielded the first offspring from the press, giving them the privacy to go through awkward faces and organic childhood experiences and everything else. Sasha and Malia, Malia. Were, Malia thank you, were hounded and picked apart by the press before they were out of high school. The White House trio got ahead of the narrative before anyone could do the same. It was a bold new plan. Three attractive, bright, charismatic, mar marketable millennials, Alex and, and Nora, are technically, technically just past gen the Gen Z threshold. But the press doesn't find it, it nearly as catchy. Catchiness sells. Coolness sells. Obama was cool. The whole first family could be cool too. Celebrities in their own right. It's not ideal, his mother always says, but it works. They're the White House trio, but here, in the music room on the third floor of the residence, they're just Alex and June and Nora, naturally glued together since they were teenagers, stunting their growth with espresso in the primaries. Alex pushes them. June steadies them. Nora keeps them honest. They settle into their usual places, June perched on her heels at the record collection, forging for some pansy climb. Nora cross-legged on the floor, uncorking a bottle of red wine. Alex sitting upside down with his feet on the back of the couch, trying to figure out what he's going to do next. He flips the HRH Prince Henry fact sheet over and squints at it. He can feel the blood rushing to his head. June and Nora are ignoring him, caught in a bubble of intimacy he can never quite penetrate. Their relationship is something enormous and incomprehensive to most people, including Alex on occasion. He knows them both, down to their split ends and nasty habits, but there's a strange girl bond between them that he can't and knows he isn't supposed to translate. I thought you were liking the post gig, Nora says, with a dull pop. She pulls the cork out of the wine and takes a swig directly from the bottle. I was, June says. I mean, I am, but it's not much of a gig. It's like one off a month and half my pitches get shot down for being too close to mom's platform. And even then, the press team has to ready anything political before I turn it in. So it's like email in these fluff pieces. And I, I know that on the other side of the screen, people are doing the most important journalism of their careers and be okay with that. So you don't like it then? June sighs. She finds the record she's looking for, slides it out of the sleeve. Sleeve? I, I don't know what else to do is the thing. They wouldn't put you, uh, they wouldn't put you on a beat? Nora asks her. You kidding? They wouldn't even let me in the building, June says. She puts the record on and sets the needle. What would really and Rebecca say? Nora tips her head and laughs. My parents would say no to, says, would say to do what they, what they did. Ditch, pfft. my parents would say to do what they did. Ditch journalism, get really into essential oils, buy a cabin in the Vermont wilderness, and own 600 L.L. Bean Best with all smells like, that all smells like patch, pachuli, patchouli, whatever that oh is. God. You left out the investing in Apple in the 90s and getting stupid rich part, June reminds her. 
details. June walks over and places her palm on the top of Nora's head, deep in her nest of curls, and leans down to kiss the back of her own fingers. I'll figure something out. Nora hands over the bottle and June takes a pull. Alex heaves a dramatic sigh. I can't believe I have to learn this garbage, Alex says. I just finished midterms. Look, you're the one who has to fight everything that moves, June says, wiping her mouth on the back of her hand, a move she'd only do in front of the two of them, including the British monarchy, so I don't really feel bad for you. Anyway, he's, he was totally fine when I danced with him. I don't get why you hate him so much. I think it's amazing, Nora says. Sworn enemies forced to make peace to settle tension between their countries? There's something totally Shakespearean about it. Shakespearean in that hopefully I'll get stabbed to death, Alex says. This sheet says his favorite food is mutton pie. I literally cannot think of a more boring food. He's like cardboard, he's like a cardboard cutout of a, per of a person. The sheet is filled with things Alex already knew, either from the royal siblings dominating the news cycle or hate reading Henry's Wikipedia page. He knows about Henry's par uh, par parentage, about his older sibling Philip and Beatrice, that he studied English literature at Oxford and plays classical piano. The rest is so trivial that he can't imagine it'll come up in interview, but there's no way he'll risk Henry being more prepared. Idea. Nora says, let's make it a drinking game. Oh, yes, June agrees. Drink every time Alex gets one right. Drink every time the answer makes you want to puke, Alex suggests. One drink for a correct answer, two drinks for a Prince Henry fact that is legitimately, objectively awful, Nora says. June has already dug two glasses out of the cabinet and she hands them to Nora, who fills both and keeps the bottle for herself. Alex slides down from the couch to sit on the floor with her. Okay, she goes on, taking the sheet from Alex's hand. Let's start easy. Parents, go. Alex picks up his own glass, already pulling a mental imagery image of Her Henry's parents, Catherine's shrewd blue eyes and Arthur's movie star jaw. Mother, Princess Catherine, oldest daughter of Queen Mary, first princess to obtain a doctorate in English literature, he, rat he rattles off. Father, Henry Fox, beloved English film and stage actor, best known for his turn as James Bond in the 80s, deceased 2015. Y'all drink! They do. And Nora passes the list to June. Okay, June says, scanning the list, apparently looking for something more challenging. Let's see. Dog's name. David, Alex says. He's a beagle, I remember, because, like, who does that? Who names a dog David? He sounds like a tax attorney, like a dog tax attorney. Drink. Best friend's name, age, and occupation, Nora asks. Best friend other than you, of course. Hmm. Alex casually gives her the finger. Percy Okonjo goes by Pez or Peza, heir to Okonjo Industries, Nigerian company leading Africa into biomedical advancements. 22, lives in London, met Harriet Eaton, Manages the Akonjo Foundation, a humanitarian nonprofit. Drink. Favorite book? Uh, Alex says. Ah, fuck. Uh, it's the one. I'm sorry, Mr. Clamron Diaz. That is incorrect, June says. Thank you for playing, but you lose. Come on, what's the answer? June peers down at the list. This says great expectations? Both Nora and Alex groan. Do you see what I mean now? Alex says. This dude is reading Charles Dickens. For pleasure. I'll give you this one, Nora says. Two drinks. Well, I think, June says, as Nora gulps away. Guys, it's kind of nice. I mean, it's pretentious, but the themes of great expectations are like love is more important than status and doing what's right beats money and power. Maybe he relates. Alex makes a long, loud fart noise. Y'all are such assholes. He seems really nice. That's because you're a nerd, Alex says. You want to protect those of your own species. It's natural instinct. I'm helping you with this out of the goodness of my heart, June says. I'm on deadline right now. Oh. You wanna go? No, no. You just want to okay. You just wanna, wanna move to okay. the future? That's okay. Hey, what do you think Sarah put on my fact sheet? Hmm, Nora says, sucking her teeth. 
Favorite summer Olympic sport? Rhythmic gymnastics. I'm not ashamed of that. Favorite brand of cockies? Gap. Listen, they look best on my ass. The JC Crew ones wrinkle all weird. And they're not cockies, they're chinos. Cockies are for white people. Allergies, dust, tied laundry detergent, and shutting the fuck up. Age of first filibuster, nine at SeaWorld San Antonio, trying to force an orca wrangler into early retirement for, quote, inhumane whale practices. I stood by it then, I stand by it now. June throws her head back and laughs, loud and unguarded, and Nora rolls her eyes. And Alex is glad, at least, that he'll have this to come back to when the nightmare is over. Alex expects Henry's handler to be the same stout storybook Englishman with tails and a top hat, probably a walrus mustache, definitely scurrying to place a velvet footstool at Henry's carriage door. The person who awaits him and his security team on the tarmac is very much not that. He's a tall 30-something Indian man in an, in an impe impeccably tailored suit, roughly handsome with a neat trimmed beard, a steaming cup of tea, and a shiny Union Jack on his lapel. Well, okay then. Ah, <sighs> God, English again. Agent Chen, the man says, extending his free hand to Amy. Hope the flight was smooth. Amy nods, as smooth as a third transatlantic flight in a week can be. The man half smiles, Commiserate, commiserative? The Land Rover is for you and your team for the duration. Uh, Amy nods again, releasing his hand, and the man turns his attention to Alex. Mr. Clemont Diaz, he says, welcome back to England. Sh Sean Sriva Sri Srivast but I don't know how to pronounce it properly. Sean, <laughs> Prince Henry's equally. Let's say, let's call it equally. Alex takes his hand and shakes it, feeling a bit like he's in one of Henry's dad's Bond movies. Behind him, an attendant unloads his luggage and carries it, off, carries it off in the direction of a sleek Austin Martin. Nice to meet you, Sean. Not exactly how we thought we'd be spending our weekend, is it? I'm not as surprised at this turn of events as I'd like to be, so, so he says, Sean says coolly with an inscrutable smile. He pulls a small tablet from his jacket and pivots on his heel towards the waiting car. Alex stares at his back, speechless, before hastily, re hastily refusing to be impressed by a grown man whose job is handling the prince's schedule, no matter how cool he is or how long and smooth his strides are. He shakes his head <laughs> a little and jogs to catch up, sliding into the back seat as Sean checks the mirrors. Right, Sean says. You'll be staying in the guest quarters of at Kestingen Palace. Tomorrow you'll be at this morning interview at nine. I've arranged for a photo call at the studio. Then it's children's cancer all afternoon. Of, uh, and off you go back to the land of the free. Okay, Alex says. He's very politely does not add, could be worse. For now, Sean says, you to come with me to chauffeur, chauffeur the prince from the stables. One of our photographers will be there to photograph the prince welcoming you to the country. So do try to look pleased to be here. Of course, there are stables the prince needs to be chauffeured from. He was briefly worried he'd been wrong about what the weekend would look like, but his feels, this feels a lot more like it. If you'll check the seat pocket in front of you, Sean says, as he reverses. There's a few papers for you to sign. Your lawyers have already approved them. He passes back an expensive looking black fountain pen. Non-disclosure agreement. The top of the first page reads. Alex flips through the, page, the last page. There are at least 15 pages of text and a low whistle escapes his lips. This is, uh, Alex says, a thing you do often? Stand a protocol, Sean says. The reputation of the royal family is too valuable to risk. Mm -hmm. The words confidential information as used in this agreement shall include the following. One, such information as, as HRH Prince Henry or any member of the royal family may designate to the guest as confidential information. Two, 
all proprietary and financial information regarding HRH, Prince Henry's personal wealth or estate. Three, any interior architectural details of royal residence, including Buckingham Palace, Kensington Palace, etc., and personal effects found therein. Four, any information regarding or involving HRH Prince Henry's personal or private life not previously released by official royalty documents, speeches, or approved biographers, including any personal or private relationship the guest may have with HRH Prince Henry. Five. Any information found on HRH Prince Henry's personal electronic device. I'm so proud of you for Thank getting you. through that. Thank you. Wow. When I read this, I scammed through this part because I was like, I'm not interested. I get shit. I get shit. This seems excessive. Like the kind of paperwork you get from some perverted millionaire who wants to hunt you for sport. He wonders what the most mind-numbingly wholesome public figure on earth could possibly have to hide. He hopes it's not people hunting. Alex is no stranger to NDAs, though, though. <laughs> Alex is no stranger to NDAs, though, so he signs and, and initials. Not like he would have divulged, divulged all the boring details of this trip to anyone anyway, except maybe June and Nora. They pull up on the stables after another 15 minutes, his security closed behind them. The royal stables are, of course, elaborate and well-kept and about a million miles from the old ranches he'd seen out in the Texas panhandle. Sean leads him out to the edge of the paddock and Amy and her team regroup 10 paces behind. Alex rests his elbows on the lacquered mm, white fence boards, fighting back the sudden absurd feeling he's underdressed for this. On any other day, his chinos and button-down would be fine for a casual photo op, but for the first time in a long time, he's feeling distinctly out of his element. Does his air, air, does his hair look awful from the plane? It's not like Henry is going to look much better after polo practice. He'll probably be sweaty and disgusting. As if on cue, Henry comes galloping around the bend on the back of a pristine white horse. He's definitely not sweaty or disgusting. He is instead bead dramatically in a sweeping and resplendent sunset, wearing a crisp black jacket and riding pants tucked into tall leather boots, looking every inch an actual fairy tale prince. He unhooks his helmet and takes it off with one gloved hand and his hair underneath is just as attractively tasseled enough to look like it's supposed to be that way. I'm going to throw up on you, Alex says, as soon as Henry's close enough to hear him. Hello, Alex, Henry says. Alex really resents the extra few inches of height Henry has on him right now. You look sober. Only for you, your royal highness, he says with an elaborate mock bow. He's pleased to hear a little bit of ice in Henry's voice, finally done pretending. You're too kind, Henry says. He swings, swings one, leg, one long leg over and dismounts from his horse gracefully, removing his glove and extending a hand to Alex. A well-dressed stable hand basically springs up out of the ground to whisk the horse away by the reins. Alex has probably never hated anything more. This is idiotic, Alex says, grabbing Henry's hand. The skin is soft, probably exfoliated and moisturized daily by some royal manicurist. <sighs> there is a royal photographer right on the other side of the fence, so he smiles willingly and says through his teeth, let's get, let's get this over with. I'd rather be waterboarded, Henry says, smiling back. The camera snaps nearby. His eyes are big and soft and blue, and he desperately needs to be punched in one of them. Your country could probably arrange that. Alex throws his head back and laughs handsomely, loud and falls. Go <laughs> fuck yourself. <laughs> Hardly enough time, Henry says. He releases Alex's hand as Sean returns. Your Highness, Sean greets Henry with a nod. Alex makes a concentrated effort not to roll his eyes. The photographer should have what he needs. If you're ready, the car is waiting. Henry turns to him and smiles again, eyes unreadable. Shall we? 
there's something vaguely familiar about the Kensington Palace guest quarters, even though he's never been there before. Sean had an attendant show him to his room, where his luggage awaited him on an ornately carved bed with spun gold bedding. Many of the rooms in the White House have a similar hauntedness, a sense of history that hangs like cobweb no matter how pristine the rooms have kept. He's used to sleeping alongside ghosts, but that's not it. It strikes further back in his memory, around the time his parents split up. They were the kind of married lawyer couple who could barely order Chinese takeout without legally binding documents. So Alex spent the summer before seventh grade shuttling back and forth from a home to their dad's new place outside of Los Angeles until they could strike a long-term agreement. It was a nice house in the valley, a clear blue swimming pool and a back wall of solid glass. He never slept well there. He'd sneak out uh, of, the th of his thrown-together bedroom in the middle of the night, stealing Helladios from his dad's freezer and standing barefoot in the kitchen, eating straight from the court, washed blue in, in the full light. That's how it feels here, somehow, wide awake at midnight in a strange place, duty-bound to make it work. He wanders into the kitchen attached to his guest wing, where the ceilings are high and the countertops are shiny marble. He was allowed to submit a list of stock to stock the kitchen, but apparently it was too hard to get Heladios, 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 and the short notice. All that's in the freezer is UK brand packaged ice cream cones. What's it like? Nora's voice said, tiny over his phone speaker. On the screen, her hair is up and she's poking at one of the dozens of window plants. Weird, Alex says, pushing his glasses up his nose. Everything looks like a museum. I don't think I'm allowed to show you though. Oh, Nora w says, wiggling her eyebrows. So secretive, so fancy. Please, Alex says, if anything is creepy. I had to sign such a massive NDA that I'm convinced I'm going to drop through a trap door into a torture dungeon any time. I bet he has a secret love child, Nora says. Or he's gay. Or he has a secret gay love child. <laughs> it's probably in case I see a, his equerry putting his batteries back in, Alex says. Anyway, it's boring. Uh, what's, what's going on with you? Your life is so much better than mine right now. Well, Nora says, Nate Silver won't stop blowing up my phone for another column. Bought some new curtains, narrowed down the list of grad school concentrations to, st to statistics or data science. Tell me those are both at GW, Alex says, hopping up to sit on one of the immaculate countertops, feet dangling. You can't leave me in D.C. to go back to MIT. Haven't decided yet, but astonishingly, it will not be based on you, Nora tells him. Remember how we sometimes talk about things that are not about you? Yeah, weirdly. So is the plan to dethrone Nate Silver as reigning data, data czar of D.C.? Nora laughs. No, what I'm going to do is silently compile and process enough data to know exactly what's going to happen for the next 25 years. Then, I'm going to buy a house on the top of a very tall hill at the edge of the city and become an eccentric reclusive and sit on my veranda. Watch it all unfold through a pair of binoculars. Alex starts to laugh, but cuts off when he hears rustling down the hall. Quiet footsteps approaching. Princess Beatrice lives in a different section of the palace, and so does Henry. The PPOs and his own security people on this floor, though, Oh, uh, the PPO's and his own security sleeps on this floor, though, so maybe... Hold on, Alex says, covering the speaker. A light flickers on in the hallway, and the person who comes padding in the kitchen is none other than Prince Henry. He's rumpled and half-awake, shoulders slumping as he yawns. He's standing in front of Alex, wearing not a suit, but a heathered gray t-shirt and plain plaid pajama bottoms. He has earbuds in, and his hair is a mess. His feet are bare. He looks alarmingly human. He freezes when his eyes fall on Alex, perched on the countertop. Alex stares back at him. In his hand, Nora begins a muffled, Is that? before Alex disconnected the calls. Disconnects the call. Henry pulls out his earbuds, and his posture has ratched back up to straight but his face is still blary and confused. Hello, he says hoarse. Sorry, I, I was just 
Cornetto's. He gestures vaguely towards the refrigerator, as if he's said something of any meaning. What? He crosses to the freezer and extracts the box of ice cream cones, showing Alex the name Cornetto across the front. I, I was out. I knew they stuffed you up. Do you ray the kitchens of all your guests? Alex asks. Only when I can't sleep, Henry says, which is always. Didn't think you'd be awake. He looks at Alex, deferring, and Alex realizes he's waiting for permission to open the box and take one. Alex thinks about telling him no just for the thrill of denying a friend something, but he's kind of intrigued. He usually can't sleep either. He nods. He waits for Henry to take a Cornetto and leave, but instead he looks back up at Alex. Um, have you practiced what you'll say tomorrow? Yeah, Alex says, bristling immediately. This is why nothing about Henry has ever intrigued him before. You're not the only professional here. I didn't mean Henry falters. I only meant, do you think we should uh, rehearse? Do you need to? I thought it might help. Of course he thinks that. Everything Henry's ever done publicly has probably been privately rehearsed in stuffy royal quarters like this one. Henry, Alex hops down, hops down off the counter, swiping his phone unlocked. Watch this. He lines up a shot, the box of Cornettos on the counter, Henry's hand braced on the marble next to it, his heavy signet ring visible with a swath of pajamas. He opens up Instagram, flips, slaps a filter on it. Nothing cures jet lag, Alex narrates in a monotone, in a monotone as he taps out captions like midnight ice cream with at Prince Henry, geotag Henry Kensington Palace and post it. He holds the phone for Henry to see as he likes, as the likes and comments immediately pour in. There are a lot of things worth overthinking, believe me, but this isn't one of them. Henry frowns at him over his ice cream. I suppose, he says, looking doubtful. Are you done? I was on a call. Henry blinks, then folds his arms over his chest, back on the defensive. Of course, I won't keep you. As he leaves the kitchen, he pauses in pauses like into the He pauses. He pauses. He pauses. <laughs> and then he goes out into the kitchen. He pauses in the door frame, considering. I didn't know you wore glasses, he says finally. He leaves Alex standing there alone in the kitchen, the box of Cornettos sweating on the counter. The ride to the studio for the interview is bumpy but mercifully quick. Alex should probably blame some of his queasiness on nerves, but chooses to blame it all on his morning's appalling breakfast spread. What kind of garbage country eats bland beans on white, white toast for breakfast? He can't decide if his Mexican blood or his Texas Texan blood is more offended. Henry sits beside him, surrounded by a cloud of attendants and stylists. One adjusts his hair with a fine tooth comb. One holds up a notepad of talking points. One tugs his collar straight. From the passenger seat, Sean sh shakes a yellow pill out of the bottle and passes it back to Henry, who readily pops it into his mouth and swallows it dry. Alex decides he doesn't want or need to know. The motor motorcade pulls up in front of the studio, and when the door slides open, there are... There's the promised photo line and barricaded royal worshippers. Henry turns and looks at him, a little grimache around his mouth and eyes. Prince goes first, then you, Sean says to Alex, leaning in and touching his airpiece. Alex takes a breath, too, and turns it on. The megawatt smile, the all-American charm. Go ahead, your royal, your royal highness, Alex says, winking as he puts on his sunglasses. Your subjects wait. Henry clears his throat and unfolds himself, stepping out into the morning and waving genially at the crowd. Cameras flash, photographers shout, and blue a blue-haired girl in the crowd lifts up a homemade poster that reads in big, glittery letters, Get in me, Prince Henry! <laughs> For about five seconds until a member of the security team <laughs> shoves it into a nearby trash can. Alex steps out next, swaggering up beside Henry and throwing an arm over his shoulders. Act like you like me, Alex says cheerfully. Henry looks at him like he's trying to choose between a million choice words before tipping his head to the side and offering up a well-rehearsed laugh, putting his arm around Alex too. 
There we go. The host of This Morning are agonizingly British. A middle-aged woman named Dottie in a tea dress and a man called Stu who looks like uh, as if he spends weekends yelling at mice in his garden. <laughs> Alex watches the introductions backstage as makeup artist conceals a stress pimple on his forehead. So this is happening. He tries to ignore Henry a few feet away to his left, currently getting a final preening from a royal stylist. It's the last chance he'll get to ignore Henry for the rest of the day. Soon Henry is leading the way out with Alex close behind. Alex shakes Dottie's hand first, smiling his politics smile at her. The one that makes a lot of congresswomen and more than a few congressmen want to tell him things they shouldn't. She giggles and kisses him on the cheek. The audience claps and claps and claps. Henry sits on the propped up couch next to him. Perfect posture and Alex smiles at him, making a show of looking comfortable in Henry's company. Which is harder than it should be because the stage lights suddenly make him uncomfortably aware of how fresh and handsome Henry looks for the cameras. He's wearing a blue sweater over a button down and his hair looks soft. Whatever, fine. Henry's annoyingly tra attractive. It's all been a th always been a thing, objectively. It's fine. Objectively? <laughs> it's always been a thing, objectively. It's fine. I'm a straight person who objectively thinks this man is beautiful yeah. and his hands are like soft and I just want to like fuck him. Just like it's just no objectively. Bro homo. Yeah. He realizes, no bro, <laughs> he realizes almost a second too late that Dottie is asking him a question. What do you think about jolly old England then, Alex? Dottie says, clearly ribbing him. Alex forces a smile. You know, Dottie, it's gorgeous, Alex says. I've been here a few times since my mom got elected and it's always incredible to see the history here and the beer selection. The audience laughs right on cue when Alex shakes out his shoulders a little. And of course, it's, it's always great to see this guy. He turns to Henry, extending his fist. Henry hesitates before stiffingly bumping his own knuckles against Alex with a heavy air of an act of treason. <laughs> Alex's whole reason for wanting to go into politics when he knows so many past president presidential presidential sons and daughters have run away screaming the minute they turn 18 is he genuinely cares about people the power is great the attention is fun but the people the people are everything he has a bit of a, a caring too much problem about most things including whether people can pay their medical bills or marry whomever they love or not get shot at school or in this case if kids with cancer have enough books to read at the Royal Marston and a NHS Foundation Trust. He and Henry and their collective horde of security have taken over the floor, flustering nurses and shaking hands. He's trying, really trying, not to let his hand clench into a fist at his sides, but Henry smiling robotically with a little bald boy plugged full of tubes for some bullshit photograph, and he wants to scream at the whole stupid country. But he's legally required to be here, so he focuses on the kids instead. Most of them have no idea who he is, but Henry gamely introduces him as the president's son, and soon they're asking him about the White House, and does he know Ariana Grande, and he laughs and indulges them. He unpacks books from the heavy boxes they've brought, climbs up into beds, and reads out loud, a photographer trailing after him. He doesn't realize he's lost track of Henry until the patient he's visiting dozes off, and he recognizes the low rumble of Henry's voice on the other side of the curtain. A quick count of feet on the floor. No photographers, just Henry. Hmm. He steps quietly over to the chair against the wall, right at the edge of the curtain. If he sits at the right angle and cranes his head back, he can barely see. Henry is talking to a little girl with leukemia named Claudette, according to the board on her wall. She's got dark skin that's turned sort of a pale gray and a bright orange scarf tied around her head and blazoned with the alliance starboard. Instead of hovering awkwardly like Alex expected, expected, Henry is squatting at her side, smiling and holding her hand. Star Wars fan, are you? 
Henry said in a low, warm voice. Alex has never heard from him before, pointing at the insignia on her scarf. Oh, it's my absolute favorite, Claudette gushes. I like to be just like Princess Leia when I'm older because she's so tough and smart and strong. And she gets to kiss Han Solo. She blushes a little at having mentioned kissing in front of the prince, but fiercely maintains eye contact. Alex finds himself craning his neck further, watching for Henry's reaction. He definitely does not recall Star Wars on the fact sheet. You know what, Henry says, leaning in conspiratorially. I think you've got the right idea. Claudette giggles. Who's your favorite? Hmm, Henry says, making a show of thinking hard. I always liked Luke. He's brave and good. He's the strongest Jedi of them all. I think Luke has proved that. It doesn't matter where you come from or who your family is. You can always be great if you're true to yourself. All right, Miss Claudette, the nurse says bring brightly as she comes around the curtain. Henry jumps and Alex almost tips his chair over, caught in the act. He clears his throat as he stands, pointing, pointedly not looking at Henry. You two can go. It's time for her meds. Miss Beth, Henry said we're mates now, Claudette practically wails. He can stay. Excuse you, Beth, the nurse tuts. That's no way to address the prince. Terribly sorry, your highness. No need to apologize, Henry tells her. Rebel commanders outright, outright royalty. He shoots Claudette a wink and a salute, and she positively melts. I'm impressed, Alex says as they walk out into the hallway together. Henry cocks an eyebrow, and Alex adds, not impressed, just surprised. At what? That you actually have, you know, feelings. Henry is beginning to smile when three things happen in a rapid su succession. The first, a shout echoes from the opposite, opposite end of the hall. The second, there's a loud pop that sounds alarmingly like gunfire. The third, Cash grabs both Henry and Alex by the arms and shoves them through the nearest door. Stay down, Cash grunts as he slams the door behind them. In the abrupt darkness, Alex stumbles over a mop and one of Henry's legs and they go crashing down together into a clattering pile of tin bed pans. Henry hits the floor first, face down, and Alex lands in a heap on top of him. <laughs> oh God, Henry says, muffled and echoing slightly. Alex thinks, hopefully, that his face might be in a bad pan. Ah, uh, you know, he says into Henry's hair, we have got to stop ending up like this. Do you mind? This is your fault. How is this possibly my fault? Henry hisses. Nobody ever tries to shoot me when I'm doing presidential appearances. But the minute I go out with a fucking royal, will you shut up before we get us both killed? Nobody's going to kill us. Cash is blocking the door. Besides, it's probably nothing. Then at least get off me. Stop telling me what to do. You're not the prince of me. Bloody hell, Henry mutters. And he pushes hard off the ground and rolls, knocking Alex onto the floor. Alex finds himself wedged between Henry's side and a shelf of what smells like industrial strength floor cleaner. Can you move over, your highness? Alex whispers, showing, shoving his shoulder against Henry's. I'd rather not be the little spoon. Believe me, I'm trying, Henry replies. There's no room. Outside, there are voices, hurried footsteps, no sign of an all clear. Well, Alex says, guess we better make ourselves comfortable. Henry exhales tightly. Fantastic. Alex feels himself shifting against his side, arm crossed over his chest in an attempt at his typical closed-off stance while lying on the floor with his feet in a mop bucket. For the record, Henry says, nobody's ever made an attempt on my life either. Well, congratulations, Alex says. You've officially made it. Yes, this is exactly how I always dreamed it would be. Locked in a cupboard with your elbow inside my ribcage, Henry snipes. He sounds like he wants to punch Alex, which is probably the most Alex has ever liked him. So he follows an impulse and drives his elbow into Henry's side, hard. Henry lets out a muffled yelp, and the next thing Alex knows, he's being yanked sideways by his shirt, and Henry is halfway on top of him, pinning him down with one thigh. His head throbs where he's clocked it against the linoleum floor, but he can feel his lips split into a smile. 
so you do have some fight in you, Alex says. He bucks his hips, trying to shake Henry off, but he's taller and stronger and has a fistful of Alex's collar. Are you quite finished? Henry says, sounding strangled. Can you perhaps stop putting your sorting life in danger now? Aw, oh, you do care, Alex says. I'm learning all your hidden depths today, sweetheart. Henry exhales and slumps off. I cannot believe even mortal peril would not prevent you from being the way you are. The weirdest part, Alex thinks, is that he said what he said was true. He keeps getting these little glimpses into things he never thought Henry was. A bit of a fighter, for one. Intelligent, interested in people. It's honestly disconcerting. No, disconcerting. He knows exactly what to say to each de Democratic senator to make them dish about bills. Exactly when Sarah's running low on nic nicotine gum. Exactly which look to give Nora for the rumor mill. Reading people is what he does. He really doesn't appreciate some inbred royal baby on up and upending his system. But he did rather enjoy that fight. He lies there, waits, listens to the shuffling of feet outside the door. Let's minutes go by. So, uh, he tries Star Wars? He means it in a, a non-threatening, off-handed way, but habit wins and he, it comes out accusatory. Yes, Alex? Henry says artfully, believe it or not, the children of the crown don't only spend their childhood going to tea parties. I assumed it was mostly poster coaching and junior polo league. Henry takes a deep, unhappy pause. That may have been part of it. So you're into pop culture, but you act like you're not, Alex says. Either you're not allowed to talk about it because it's unseemingly for the crown, or you choose not to talk about it because you want people to think you're cultured. Which one? Are you psychoanalyzing me? Henry asks. I don't think royal guests are allowed to do that. I'm trying to understand why you're so committed to acting like someone you're not, considering you just told that little girl in there that greatness means being true to yourself. I don't know what you're talking about, and if I did, I'm not sure that's any of your concern, Henry says, his voice strained at the edges. Really? Because I'm pretty sure I'm legally bound to pretend to be your best friend, and I don't know if you've thought this through yet, but that's not going to stop with this weekend, Alex tells him. Henry's fingers go tense against his forearm. If we do this, and we're never seen together again, people are going to know we're full of shit. We're stuck with each other, like it or not, so I have the right to be clued in about what your deal is before it sneaks up on me and bites me in the ass. Why don't we start? Henry says, turning his head to squint at him. This close, Alex can just make out the silhouette of Henry's strong royal nose. With you telling me why exactly you hate me so much. Do you really want to have that conversation? Maybe I do. Alex crosses his arm, arms, recognizes it as a mirror to Henry's tick, and uncrosses them. Do you really not remember being a prick to me at the Olympics? Alex remember, remembers it in vivid detail. Himself at 18, dispatched to Rio with June and Nora, the campaign's delegation to the summer games. One weekend of photo ops and selling the next generation of global corporation image. Alex spent most of it drinking Caprinas and subs Capri Capri Caprinas and subse subsequently throwing Caprinas up behind Olymp Olympic venues. And he remembers down to the Union Jack on Henry's Honorock the first time they met. Henry sighs. Is that the time you threatened to push me into the Thames? No, Alex says. It was the time you were a condescending prick at the diving finals. Do you really not remember? Remind me. Alex glares. I walked up to you to introduce myself, and you stared at me like I was the most offensive things you had the most offensive thing you had ever seen. Right after you shook my hand, you turned to Sean and said, Can you get rid of him? A pause. Ah, Henry says. He clears his throat. I didn't realize you heard that. I feel like you're missing the point, Alex says, which is that it's a douchey thing to say either way. That's fair. Yeah, so 
That's all? Henry asks. Only the Olympics. I mean, that was the start. Henry pauses again. I'm sensing an ellipsis. It's just, Alex says, as he's on the floor of a supply closet, waiting out a security threat with the Prince of England at the end of a weekend that has felt like some very specific ongoing nightmare. Censoring himself takes so much effort. I don't know. Doing what we do is fucking hard, but it's harder for me. I'm the son of the first female president, and I'm not white like she is. Can't even pass for it. People will always come down harder on me. And you're, you know, you. You were born into all of this, and everyone thinks you're Prince fucking charming. You're basically a living reminder I'll always be compared to someone else, no matter what I do. Even if I work twice as hard. Henry is quiet for a long while. Well, Henry says when he speaks at last, I can't very well do much about the rest, but I can tell you I was, in fact, a prick that day. Not that it's any excuse, but my, my father had died four months, 14 months earlier, before. 14 months before! And I was still kind of a prick every day of my life at the time. And I'm sorry. Henry twitches one hand at his side and Alex falls momentarily silent. The cancer award. Of course. Henry chose the cancer award. It was right there on the fact sheet. Father, famed film star Arthur Fox, deceased 2015, pancreatic cancer. The funeral was televised. He goes back over the last 24 hours in his head. The sleeplessness, the pills, the tense little grimache Henry does in the public that Alex has always read as aloofness. He knows a few things about this stuff. It's not like his parents' divorce was a pleasant time for him, or like he runs himself ragged about grades for fun. He's been aware for too long that most people don't navigate thoughts of whether they'll ever be good enough or if they're disappointing the entire world. He never considered Henry might feel any of the same things. Henry clears his throat again, and something like panic catches Alex. He opens his mouth and says, Well, good to know you're not perfect. He can almost hear Henry roll his eyes, and he's thankful for it. The familiar comfort and antagonism. They're silent again, the dust of the conversation settling. Alex can't hear anything outside the door or any sirens on the street. But nobody had come to get them yet. Then, unprompted, Henry sends, says into the street stretching stillness, Return of the Jedi. A beat. What? To answer your question, Henry says, Yes. I do like Star Wars, and my favorite is Return of the Jedi. Oh, Alex says, wow, you're wrong. Henry huffs out the tiniest, most poshly indignant puff of air. It smells minty. Alex resists the urge to throw another elbow. How can I be wrong about my own favorite? It's a personal truth. It's a personal truth that is wrong and bad. <laughs> Which do you prefer then? Please show me the error of my ways. Okay, Empire. Henry sn sniffs. So dark, though. Yeah, which is what makes it good, Alex says. It's the most thematically complex. It's got Han, the Han and Leia kiss in it. You mean, you meet Yoda. He has, he, Han is at the top of his game. Fucking Lando Calrissian. I have not watched Star Wars, I'm sorry. <laughs> Did you tell him? Did you tell him? Lando Calrissian and the best twist in cinematic history. What does Jada have? Do you know what have? the twist is? And that he, it's his father. Oh yeah, yeah, good job. Good job. Yeah. You've lived on planet Earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm so happy. What does Jedi have? Fucking Ewoks. Ewoks are iconic. Ewoks are stupid. But Endor. But ha. There's a reason that people always call the best, grittiest installment of a trilogy the Empire of the series. And I can appreciate that, but it's, it's isn't there something to be valued in a happy ending as well? Spoken like a true Prince Charming. <laughs> I'm only saying, I like the resolution of Jedi. It ties everything up nicely. And the overall theme you are, you are intended to take away from the film is hope and love and, and, you know, all that. Which is what Jedi leaves you with a sense of most of all. Henry coughs and Alex is turning to look at him again when the door opens and... Cash's giant silhouette appears. False alarm, he says, breathing heavily. Some dumbass kid brought fireworks for their friend. He looks down at them, flat on their backs, blinking up at the sudden harsh light of the hallway. This looks cozy. 
Yep, we're really bonding, Alex says. He reaches a hand out and lets Cash haul him to his feet. Outside Kensington Palace, Alex take Hen takes Henry's phone out of his hand and swiftly opens a blank contact page before he can protest or sick a PPO on him for violating royal property. The car is waiting to take him back to the royal's private airstrip. Here, Alex says, that's my number. If we're going to keep this up, it's going to get annoying to keep going through handlers. Just text me. We'll figure it out. Henry stares at him, expression blankly bewildered, and Alex wonders how this guy has any friends. Right, Henry says finally. Thank you. No booty calls, Alex tells him, and Henry <laughs> chokes on a laugh. This book this is, is so, so fucking gay! This book is so awesome, though. Oh like, I love this book so much. This is for sure a book that I could, like, read multiple times. Yeah, I've already done it. Yeah. It's, I have already done it. Yeah. Me, a person. Can you appreciate the English? Like, oh, yeah, yeah, how yeah, yeah. good it's it so is good. in it's English? So good, so good, so good. It's just so natural, so good, so and, like, good, so the good. dialogue is so flowing, yeah. and it's just... Ah, uh, this... Uh, and it just gets better, you guys. Like, yes, it does. oh my god, there are so many scenes that I would just love to read out loud. Um, it's such a good... Not the smut. I think this is, like, all we're going to read from it. Yeah, I like the idea of just doing like one shots of these where we can like sure. read a bit of a book and uh, you guys can love it and buy it and read it. And if there's like a book that you love that you want me to read for Ollie, um, shout it, it into, into the, the void. void and we'll find out. Yeah. Uh, I have a few more like on my And if you list. want us to get a Patreon where we read smut, shout it into the void. We'll definitely hear that. We're going to go have dinner now. Yeah. And... Uh, We'll catch you guys in the Rex in the Rex reading rook in the fish in the Rex reading rook. My brain has officially said goodnight. We should have a theme song for like the end of the videos. It could go like yeah, it could go like boop da na 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 na. That's what you want. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.